Chris, what's going on, man? Thanks for joining me back again after three years on the on the Order of Man podcast. Yeah, looking forward to chatting. It's been a while, man. Yeah, lots lots going on. I'm sure in both of our lives, and uh, I was pretty excited when you reached out with your with your new book and wanted to do this again. I know that uh, we had a lot of positive response when you first came on, and just in reading through your book, man, absolutely incredible story that I kind of wish I would have known when we first had our conversation. <laughs> we would have had a lot more to talk about. That's for sure. <laughs> What yeah. was the uh, what was the catalyst for writing the book? It uh, it's been something I've actually wanted to do for an enormously long time. I know you know everybody's got you know my story's not worse or better than anybody else's, but I definitely have had a an interesting scope uh, as far as my life arc, and I wanted to share the lessons from that. And I got to a point that's been you know all my businesses are f- centered around physical strength, mm-hmm. and sure. which is a critical thing, I think, in pursuit, uh, you know, that we all need to pursue, but arguably mental, emotional, or even spiritual strength are much more important. I mean, you can't, in my mind, can't, you can't miss any one of those pillars. Uh, But I, I, it's been something I've wanted to have for a long time. And I felt the best way to express it was to really dive really deep into it and, uh, and do a book. And so I finally got my businesses to the point where, you know, I'm more in a, uh, a mentoring role than a direct like operations management role. And so that allowed me to take the time away because I, I spent you know pretty solid like nine months or longer. Like that was kind of my focus. And, mm. you know, it makes things uh, a little more challenging if you're trying to run, you know, run some businesses and train and be, be a, you know, be a, be a father and a husband and all that. Right. So, you know, you don't want to let the, those really key important things, uh, set to the side. So it was really just like getting to a point where I could create the space so that I could do it. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm glad to talk about the key important things. It seems to me that more and more, whether it's probably just social media really, but everybody's talking about their business and being an entrepreneur and which I know you don't like that term. I don't tend uh, to like that either. It's overused uh, and entrepreneurs is what, I, what I like to call most everybody out there. Entrepreneurs. That's right. Yeah. Like, no, you're a real estate agent. You're a, a rep for, you know, <laughs> right. for, for some CBD oil. You're, this is not a, that you're not an entrepreneur. Everybody thinks right. like, maybe even you're a business owner, but yeah. you're not an, you know, like, yeah. Anyway. And, you know, it's, that stuff's important. You know, the business stuff, the business aspect, career aspirations, all that stuff's important. But, you know, so is this other, this other facet that we don't hear a whole lot about, which is family and taking care of yourself. And yeah, it's just something that seems to be, uh, not as, not as focused on because it's, it's, it's sexy, right? It's glamorous to have the business and be the entrepreneur and, 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 and be hustling and grinding. And it's like, man, I just, I want to play, I want to play in the yards with my kids. <laughs> like That's but what why, I want to do. But, but the, why are we doing those things to begin with? Right. Yeah. And yeah. it's to create that for, you know, a good environment for those, for, for that. And, uh, I think people miss it. And that's like what I really tried to drive home in the book is getting people to think deeper about, you know, step one, like people want to jump to these like goals, the bucket list, like whatever, like chasing whatever's popular at the time, you know, right now, entrepreneur is the popular thing to chase. Like what, mm-hmm. but like, what are your values in life? Like, what do you, how do you want to live? What people do you want to have around you? What do you want to get out of life? What do you want to contribute? Uh, you know, what are the key things for you? And then start like figuring out like, okay, what are the goals I need to have that are going to help me realize that? And, right. uh, you know, people, people don't want to walk like that's the foundational piece and it's hard. Like you've got to really be honest with yourself and ask some deep questions to get there to know that. Yeah. It seems to me like people are, are chasing other people's dreams because that's what they've been told is important, right? You have to do X, Y, and Z because if you don't do that, then you're not going to be successful or you're not a man or you're not fill in the blank. And so we run around and pursue all these other goals. And, you know, in a lot of ways, the, the worst thing that can happen is you can hit those goals and then you realize, oh, man, for the past three or four decades, I've been chasing the wrong thing and I'm not happy that, still, even though I've achieved this. Yeah, that have actually counterproductive to those values that you want in life. Yeah. Like, and, and they can be like, and even just like people, you know, and you could be chasing what you feel that you want. And this is like a frustration for me is like people they, they often like identify with maybe some physical things or trips or whatever it is. And not really like, why do I want those things? Because usually it's an expression of something 
else. Like in mm -hmm. my book, I, I talk about like, hey, if you want to, you know, uh, you know, a mansion and a fancy cars, like there's lots of different reasons why people would want those things. OK, for me, if I wanted those, that would be because security for myself and my family, if I know if I had those things, that's not really what I'm after. But like I'm using an example, like that's what it, it, it would mean to me. Like so maybe mm -hmm. internally I've like got, hey, I want this stuff. And if I go chase that, I could end up over leveraging myself to achieve it and got it and boom. And what have I done? I've created the opposite of security because now I'm like locked into this mortgage and all these, you know, all these things. And I've actually created, I, I thought, I, I thought I got what I wanted, but I didn't understand why, why, why I wanted those things. Mm. And that's what I really want people to kind of dive deeper and understand those whys. Do you feel like this is pretty prevalent in the the fitness, the health, the strength industry? Is that a lot of, uh, external validation rather than this internal validation and values that you're talking about now? I, I do. I really do. And I've, I've been doing some posts more recently on, you know, just kind of not in depth, but like, you know, here's a picture of me and my family going for a walk and like, Hey, guess what? You know, I'm not a millionaire and I don't want to be a millionaire, but I'm rich. I'm rich mm. in all the things that I have because this is what I want. And I'll list them out. Like, what are the things that you want? Or, you know, the other day I was, this week, uh, I was putting new registration tags on my truck, right? Because everybody always wants to post their new vehicles and this and that online. Like, look at my success. Look at my, everybody needs to ha have this. And there's there's some really popular figures that I, I, I like that really say, you know, this is the stuff you, you need to chase and it's okay to have it. I'm like, but that's not for everyone. So right. I'm putting the tags on and I realize, oh, I'm putting the tags on my 15, this is 15 years coming up that I'm driving the same daily driver. And yeah. you know what? I'm proud of it. Like, you know what? Maybe I'm going to, maybe I'm going to have it for 20. I'm still going to be driving the same thing. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's just, I don't know. I'm just like, because that's opposite of like really what we see promoted out there, particularly in that, that, yeah, the fitness realm. I think it's really, really prevalent. Yeah, I bet. I bet. So that's why it's when you said earlier how there's other strengths, right? There's, there's physical, there's mental, there's a emotional, there's, there's, uh, mental strength and all these things. I think that's, I think that's important. I think that's what makes a well-rounded man. And I, and I don't actually think they can be separated. I think if you can learn to become mentally stronger, then that's only going to help you become physically stronger and Ab vice versa. Absolutely. I mean, let's, let's, that, that goes back to, uh, you know, Socratic philosophy, right? I mean, that's, th th this dates way back that, and uh, it's only really in our modern age that we've kind of started separating these things out. Oh, you're, you know, if you're, if you're strong, you know, physically, you're probably, you know, you're a, you're a meathead, right? Mm -hmm. You're, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and really to me, you know, strength is, and I speak to this, well, I, in a lot of different platforms, but strength is becoming resilient to stress, our ability to handle increasing, you know, demands, for ourselves. It's the ability to, to adapt and become a stronger version of ourselves from any stress that comes at us, right? And that that's not everybody understands that when it's training. Yeah, if I go to the gym and I add five pounds and I do this, like I'm I'm getting stronger, I'm getting more resilient. I'm become you know, and you're becoming physically a better version of yourself. You know, if you get bumped by a car or something like that, you're not going to be hurt as bad. You're not going to, if you fall down, like this is, this is that, but it's the exact same things when it, it comes to like mental and emotional strength. Like if you don't challenge yourself, you're going to get soft. Just like mm -hmm. if you don't go to the gym, like you need to be challenging your mind. You need to be chasing things that are, you know, we don't need to be seeking comfort. We need to be doing the exact opposite of that. If I feel comfortable in life, I need to go find something that scares me. A new project for you, like I see it all the time, like on your platforms following you, you know, you're, you're chasing these things for your business. It's not because you're wanting to be an entrepreneur, but like that continual, de you know, demand to be a better version, trying to create and grow forward. And that's, what is that you're, you're putting, you're putting the stress. I know you are like on yourself on, you know, and, uh, that's how we become better. Like it's adapting to those things. And if you don't have them in your life, 
It's the same thing if you don't quit going to the gym. You start atrophying. Right. Yeah. I think it's easier in a lot of ways when it comes to physical fitness because it's tangible, right? Mm -hmm. So you put five more pounds on your bar and you can physically see the representation of your strength versus it's not as it's not as easy to recognize if you're more mentally tough. Yep. Right. So it's the Absolutely. same thing with business. I think a lot of guys will naturally gravitate towards business over being heavily involved with their family. Because if I go into business or finance, for example, I can see, well, I've got more clients. Yep. I made more revenue. But what does being a better dad even mean? Yep. Right. Like, how do you wrap that up and yep. make it tangible? I, I, I love your openness about uh, your discussions of a number of years back when you and your wife were struggling with mm. your relationship. And that's exactly Exactly. It. Those are those are hard measurables. You don't get the my paycheck has gone up. Right. Like, right. Look, I'm winning for my family. I've got a bigger paycheck. But you're coming home. You're not engaged. You're not. You know, like you're working on the week. You know, like you're just not there for those people. And at the end of the day, they don't care. You mm -hmm. know, that you've got a bigger paycheck and maybe there's more food and you know, <laughs> you know, fancier food in the fridge or whatever yeah. it is. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's sometimes kind of. People miss that. But even on the business side, you see a lot of people that actually their goal is to find that cake job. Like, oh, I make all this money, but I don't really have to do anything, you know, like and then ease through. All I got to do is get through the week mm. and then I've got the weekend. You know, I can watch, you know, watch the game, kick yeah. it with my friends, go golf and whatever it get is, drunk, like, whatever it is you drunk. do. Right? Yeah, exa exactly. And I'm like, you know what? Like. The best day of the week is well. It actually like, for me like starts Sunday night. I start kind of like thinking about here's the things that I want to accomplish this week. This is what I'm gonna knock at. Like, like it should be those challenges should be rewarding. They should be work, just like going to the gym, right? Like you don't you don't just go in going ah oh, yeah this is gonna be, you know you 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 go in to push yourself, and then you feel the rewards of like knowing that you put that effort in. And again, yeah, nobody knows think... when you've done that, so. Right. Well, that's true. You don't get to post that kind of stuff on Instagram and get all the likes and the accolades and everything else, which is kind of a kind of a shame because what we end up seeing is everybody's highlight reel and all the good things they're doing. And you never really see the amount of effort and work that went into securing. I mean, uh, our place is a prime example. We live in this this beautiful home. We've got some land and people are like, oh, you're so lucky. You're so fortunate. It's like, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, we're fortunate, but I spent the last 10 years of ups and downs and struggles in my marriage and struggles with business and making uh, mistakes to get to this point. I think the lesson is not that we're here. The lesson is found in the past 10 years of struggle. Absolutely. And that's, that's exactly, I mean, that is like the foundation, like that book, being able to show people like... They see, you know, people that follow me, your audience may not, you know, know exactly who I am, but I've been really successful in the athletic world. I've been really successful in the business world. A second time around now is, <laughs> I do the air quotes, an entrepreneur versus working for somebody else. Sure. I guess technically I am because I own like five different, five different businesses right now. But, uh, um, it, it, and they see like the hobbies, like building vehicles from the ground, like all this. And like, they just see that and like, oh my God, but they don't see like what I had to get through to get here. And, yeah. you know, and that's really what I wanted to, to talk through. And the fact that that is like, for me, this is, this is the life I want to live. I'm not after something like, again, that extravagant lifestyle. I'm not after being a million, doing these other, you know, I don't want to be the next meathead millionaire or anything like I want to have time and space for my family mm -hmm. to be able for us to be able to do the things that we want to do. I want to be able to do like my passion um, is as my as my living, my ability to try to help people become stronger versions of themselves, giving them out of pain and creating new innovative solutions, which also mixes in with my hobbies of creating, designing products and and tools and all this sort of stuff and everything just flows together. Now there's no, and that's what I'm after. Like work is no longer work. It's a, it's a, an expression of who I am. Right. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's not that like traditional nine to five where you just like yeah. grind through it and you're living, like you said earlier for the weekend and you're dreading yeah. Monday and, and you start acting differently. Look, I've been in a situation 
where I've turned into a complete dick on Sunday night because I know what's going to happen in the next 12 hours and I'm going to have to get my butt up and go to a job that I absolutely despise and then all of it pours over into my family dynamic. It's not – Oh yeah. it was not a great way to live and there's a lot of guys that are in that boat right now, man. I Yep, there is. Yep. I think we ought to back up. We kind of just jumped right into it, which which I like, and we're having this powerful <laughs> conversation. But but the book's called The Eagle and the Dragon, and as I was reading through it, I was really fascinated with with your tattoos, which is where the the book title comes from, and the significance and meaning of the eagle and the dragon. Can you walk us through that a little bit so the guys have some context? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, I've got two tattoos that kind of cover most of my body. Uh, when I the first one I had I done around 20 years old. And it is, there's a shackle around my ankle, a chain and some flower, you know, some vines and other stuff that run up my leg. And there's a, a big giant eagle uh, on my stomach and he's tied to that chain. And there's a big giant eagle across my back, same thing, tied to that same. And they're, they're taking flight, not a traditional like eagle tattoo pose that you see. And they're trying to take off and fly. And I got those done at that age because it was all about, I really believe that you could you could fly to whatever heights, like accomplishing whatever you wanted in the world. But the only thing really holding you back at the end was yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the idea behind there. So a little context to that is is my story. So, um, you know, I grew up by that time I had lived my life probably about half of my life up to that point was homeless. So we're talking, you know, I was, uh, I'll give you a sample story, you know, six years old, you know, we were living by a little stream up in the, uh, uh Northern California wilderness and there was rattlesnake dens all around. And so to avoid them, we like chopped down some small, uh, uh, alder trees and took the poles and lashed them up into the trees so that we could sleep up in the, have our beds up in there. Cause I had a, I was six, I had a brother who was four and a sister who was two and my mother was pregnant. We had no transportation or anything like that. We were just living in the woods. And uh, there was a, a half built house, you know, down the road. We were kind of uh, off of their property a little bit. These other, you know, hippie folks that never were able to finish building their home and they had this big giant uh, kind of cauldron like thing or watering trough. It must have been like 10 feet around, a couple feet deep, like raised up. So like once a week or so, we'd go build a fire under it, go dig up some soapstone or soap root. So we could spend it all day heating it up and take a bath. And, That's uh, crazy. That's so wild. We, we, so for, for, for enter entertainment, we'd like catch dragonflies and like tie playing cards to them and then let them loose at the same time. And so we could know which one won the race. Uh, oh really? Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh my well, yeah, there's no TV, no nothing, you know, right, like, right. and, uh, but I, I'm sitting there. This is, uh, this is my first, uh, tale of about, uh, chasing fear, which I think is, it, it ties to that mental and emotional aspect of like challenging yourself. But this is a little extreme. This is, but this is the environment I live with. And, uh, there was rattlesnakes all over. So my, my father or stepfather taught me how to capture them live. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, with a fork stick and, you know, making sure that you, you got them to strike, catch them behind the neck, but I'm here at six years old, you know, holding live rattlesnake in my hand with it wrapped around, you know, my, my arm looking into it, looking down its, its throat, you know, fangs hanging out. It's like, I'm, I'm holding death in my hands, you know, Yeah, for sure. and, uh, you know, got to learn how to, where to cut it at. So it doesn't, you know, the venom sacks don't, uh. They explode uh, or like contaminate the meat, but uh, that's that's the type of homelessness I'm talking about. Like, you know, heating up jugs of water from the you know filling up jugs of water in a stream, setting them in the sun on a rock so you could bathe yourself. And this is while I'm like going to school through the years, and and then there's just some really bad stuff that happened. I'm not going to dive really into deep depth of it, but you know there was encounters with uh, murderers, obviously lots of. Uh, drug running, drug abuse, all that stuff going on around me. And uh, there was a time uh, where the, the, the state came in and took me. I had uh, three sisters and a brother took us all into, uh, uh, into care. And there was a year of doing that, which was a really dark time for me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there was 
actually an entertaining story. Uh, let me finish this. So my mom, I mentioned she was pregnant there with the, uh, with the, by the rattlesnake dens. My, uh, so my second sister was born. My, my mom had to, uh, she's a tough cookie. Let me tell you, but oh, it uh, seems like it. I mean, you'd have she, to be to be in that circumstance yeah. for sure. She, she had to hike out to the, uh, the gravel road when she went into labor and flagged down the first vehicle that finally came by, which happened to be a dump truck. So she climbed into the back of the dump truck and they drove the dump truck like into the emergency room of the hospital. She oh, climbed up, goodness. she climbed out the back and went inside and birthed my sister. Uh, so, oh, wow. Oh my goodness. And then a, a week later, you know, she's up there, you know, sitting, you know, in the camp, you know, nursing my sister and, uh, yeah, anyway, wow. so, so <clears throat> there's encounters with a, a serial killer, human trafficking, like all sorts of shit during my, my upbringing that made it really, really rough. Uh, I was definitely a loner, like not really, cause we were moving all the time. And, uh, by the time I got to high school, we finally had a stable, like stable home to live in. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, my stepfather had won a disability suit maybe got like five grand or something like that. And we were able to put a down payment on this mobile home out there in central Oregon. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't have doors on the inside. It didn't have a kitchen. So we had to, you know, throw up some, uh, some lumber and things like that to mount a sink to. And, but it did have running water and electricity. And so it ended up being a really like stable place for me while I went to high school. Again, massive amount of like, you know, alcohol and drug stuff going on and, you know, as well during that time. But, uh, um, so anyway, I w ended up getting, uh, I, I did really well athlete, uh, academics, all that stuff, got a full ride scholarship to uh, go to an engineering school. And a couple years in, I ended up, uh, having to take custody of my three younger sisters one at a time, um, and ended up raising all of them, uh, through their teenage years into, uh, into adulthood. Um, while I was finishing my engineering degrees, getting my master's and kind of pursuing my career just to get them out of that environment. So right. that's where, that's where I was at. Like when I got that tattoo. So, how, so how old were so you when you got that tattoo? Uh, I was about 20 years old. Okay. So you were so, just, just into college then about that time. Yep. Yep. And so it was to me, it was, well, and this is what I cover in the book. It's, it's about discover, you know, how, go, how, how to go go about discovering your strengths and uh -huh. really realizing your full potential and not real separating your environment from who you are. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people in today's world really, really miss this because you talk to a lot of people and you ask them who they are and they will tell you their, their victimhood, their bad, I'm a, you know, um, you know, uh, I'm a person with alcoholic parents and this is why I am the way I am. I'm a blah, 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 blah. I'm the guy with a bad back. I'm a, like, they define themselves by these things that have happened to them. Right. And yeah, you know, my, my proposition and the way I live my life and the way I lived my life at that time too, was you, know, you are not your environment. Sure. Those things happen to you and they may affect you to some level, but you are defined by your actions and responses to those things that happen to you, not by those things themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's really what that first part of that book about is like separating and understanding. Like I'm telling this story to you right now, and it's literally just a story to me. This is the, the end, almost the entire book is not me anymore. Those it's a story to help me articulate these messages and philosophies. And that's why I share it because it's a really great way uh, a story to articulate those things. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a homeless guy growing up in the woods. Like I am, I am who I am today. Right. You know, and I have created that. And that's, so that is actually the second half of the book. So the second half of the book, it's a tattoo I had done just before I was 40. And it's a, it's a, it's a dragon. Um, it's an Ouroboros and it covers my entire upper body. So it's on my chest, this big dragon head. It wraps around my my back, my shoulders, and comes back around, and it's eating its own tail. And that's the Ouroboros. Mm. It's the continual renewal of life, the sure. new new beginnings, infinity, whatever you want to call it, out with the old, in with the new. And so for me, it's it, it is around self actualization. It is purposely deciding. So this is the, the the first part of the book is about separating 
identity of self from your environment and discovery of your capabilities. The second half of the book is about really more purposeful action. It's about deciding specifically who you want to be and then how you become that person. So, so it's very purposeful in, in, in its, in its nature. And, um, and so that's, that's where the, the entire second half of the book about, and that is, is brought about like me leaving. I had a very successful executive career. I was doing company turnarounds around like aerospace manufacturing companies, automotive manufacturing. Like I did this, I was sought after for doing this type of work. Um, Oh yeah, I lifted weights and stuff like that too. Yeah, all the some, somewhere in between, uh, you, some, you, somewhere you in threw there, up some I, weight. <laughs> I threw up some weight. I was ranked number one in the world for like eight years straight. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> anyway, uh, owned a gym on the side. Did you know? There's there's lots of other pieces of the story, right? But um, I'm just trying to hit the the, the, the high points here. Sure. But it was coming into about five years ago where I decided that you know what I needed, like what I needed to do in the world was very specific in nature. Um, I'm very good on the coaching and leadership. And that's what I enjoy is like pushing people and having them find and discover more potential in themselves than they ever thought possible. And then the physical nature of things like I'm very good at. So like creating methodologies, equipments, all this sort of stuff. And so I walked away from that high powered career for the unknown. Um, and, uh, a lot of it too was also my kids getting older and, uh, Realizing they're going to be in sports, both I'm training at a world class level. I'm a, you know, I'm an executive. I've got some hobbies that consume a little bit of time. I'm like, what, what has to give here? Like, is it family? Is it the job? Is it training? Is it, you know, the the things that bring me, you know, pleasure? Uh, and I'm like, what's the lowest ranking one there? Ah, oh, it's the job. Hmm. I'm going to quit the job. Right. Logical opinion. You know, when you're <laughs> when you're also making a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I mean, that that's that's a key component because you do have responsibilities that you've got to take care of as well. Exactly. So and, and, and that is like and that is actually really key, too, because it is like you don't get to, in my opinion. So I I'd considered because <clears throat> the physical side of things really interest me. I'd been considering going back to school to be a doctor for a long time. Mm. Uh, um, physical therapy, chiropractic, surgeon, something along those natures. Right. Orthopedics. And uh, I'm like, I ran the numbers a bunch of times and I'm like, I cannot ask my family to sacrifice that much yeah. for me to do this. Like I can't, like the cost for me not to work doing what I do, the amount of time, even though I'm highly educated, none of it goes into that curriculum. Mm. Like, th and then the cost of schooling and post, you know, post school, you know, working in, you know, the, um, uh, doing, it's not internships there, but I can't think of the name anyway. Anyway, I'm like that, that's like, we're talking millions of dollars, like adding up, like, I'm like that sacrifice is not okay for me to ask of my family for me to do chase, like, you know, a passion. Um, but, uh, to circle back around, like that's, but I figured out a way to do it for me to create it in another way that it actually, I could reach more people. And, uh, but I made a lot of other shifts at the same time. Like I had to cut, I cut people out of my life, uh, that were counterproductive. Um, and I kind of talk about the, who you choose and don't choose, uh, in the book and the process for that. Um, you know, we're not talking, you know, just cutting out, you know, naysayers, but the people that are continually just negative or pessimistic or, sure. and, and they have that output in their entire life. Right. So that's all they like, can add to your life is negativity. I'm like, this is not something I can't be constantly putting out for you and not have a reciprocal, like true relationship. Sure. And, uh, and so, and, and I, I walked away from my competitive lifting at the same time. So, and I actually didn't even realize it until I was writing the book and I'm like, Oh, Oh, the same thing. I didn't want to, Basically, I was walking away from anything that created any sort of external control in my life mm -hmm. that, you know, I have to do this because this certain set of rules or these dates must be met or this. And I wanted to, like I said, I want to be able to fully express, you know, what I what I want to do in the world and not be constrained by those things. So I shifted from competitive lifting and I was one of the best in the world to doing what I call exhibition lifting. 
So I do these big feats of strength combined with a charity that I believe in. Mm. And so that way uh, I'm still get that competitive outlet for myself, but I define the rules. I define the dates I define. And then it's doing something that I really believe in. Right. It's attached and to purpose. It's attached. Exactly. Um, and unfortunately I, well, not unfortunately, like it was very, it was purposeful. I, I, I did leave my wife uh, during the course of this as well. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm not proud of that. Um, but it was part of the, that whole process of analyzing people in my life. And, uh, mm. I don't need to go into details. She's an amazing woman, amazing mother of my children, but really wasn't going to be part of of me moving forward in a positive manner to do this. And, uh, but I did get remarried because, uh, interesting, like finding, like creating a, uh, creating businesses with like purpose, like it draws like such amazing talent to you. So like course, the sure. people that I have in my business is the best. And I've worked in big organizations. I've worked at a lot of different places, the best team I've ever worked with. So by creating like this magnetic thing that draws like-minded people, people with purpose and vision and shared those shared values that are going to come together. And I ended up finding uh, a new wife or partner or, you know, in that, like in that same process. So I ended up finding a, just an incredible person. Uh, and, uh, you know, every day we're spending talking about where we're going what we're doing together and how we're, how we're working on this as a team. And it's just been absolutely fantastic. I really didn't know what like really truly love in that aspect was beyond like love of family until, mm. until I met her. And I, I never, I never would have, if I didn't like create this thing that actually drew her into my life. Right. And so um, interesting. Cause I, I mean, you know, you do all these things and you say, okay, these are good. These are moving me in the right direction. But I think what guys need to understand and what I think you would attest to, correct me if I'm wrong, is that just because you're making these decisions that move you in potentially the right direction doesn't make those decisions easier. Because I can't imagine you leaving your wife or oh stepping out of competitive lifting was an easy decision for you no. to make. No. And like leaving my wife, you know, because we had two children together. I've got three now. Uh, but uh you know, just the thoughts, because like for me, looking at my upbringing, I've, I've never wanted to have like that big instability or anything that could be negative to my children's life. And so like I I was a mess like over that decision and and, you know, like moving through the process, like my head, my gut, like I, I you know, it's OK to seek help, too. Like I ended up uh, seeing a psychologist during that time to kind of work through and process some of this. And uh, uh, because it was it was so scary for me. And just like I. That's <laughs> why I had never done it sooner, I guess. Um, yeah. Sure. And uh, uh, but ended up being a very positive process. And I've got an incredible relationship with uh, with their mother now. And we live five minutes apart. We both share the kids, see them every day. Like it's really, really fantastic um, the way where it's been able to uh, to get to. But yeah, it was. This is hard. I'm, I'm talking about this is hard stuff. Like I went through some hard stuff when I was younger. But when you're the one making the decisions, that's making that change versus being ridden along, even though it's some crazy stuff, is totally different. Right? Well, I mean, not only that, but you also have you also have something to compare it to, right? Because sometimes you don't have anything com to compare to, especially when you're a child. Like life is life. Like there's no other life that you're like, oh, well, how come yeah. we don't have it like that? You know, it's just I, your, I your deal. I know, but people, when they read this, they're like, oh my God, what was that really like? And I'm like, life? actually, it, it was just normal. Like, yeah, we right. went out, <laughs> like killed some animals and hunted for some <laughs> mushrooms. And like, hey, right. that's just what we did. Isn't that like, what everybody does? Like right. you don't have it. I'm like, think about it like a hundred years ago, that's what everybody was doing. Mm -hmm. Like not everyone, but like this was much more like, it's not like it was terrible. Like this was just life. And actually most of history is closer to like what I grew up in. It's just very, I had a much different experience than most people I'd interact with today. Sure. So. Yeah. It's foreign for a lot of people. Well, I, you know, I want to back up because we need to fill in some gaps because there, there's a ton there. Um, and it didn't just happen, you know, like Obviously, obviously, uh, you're intimately familiar with the process. <laughs> what, uh, what had to happen for you in order to 
look at maybe some experiences once you had some framework about your past to use those as an opportunity to grow and to build and develop uh, and maybe to unshackle the ego go a little bit, if you will, versus somebody who takes those experiences and uh, uses them negatively or turns into the victim like you alluded to earlier or self-destructs because they had those circumstances. What is what is the differentiating factor there or factors? Um, that's a good question. I'm going to I'm going to go a couple different routes there. So I think a lot of like my younger uh, adulthood is I, I didn't really uh, like do a lot of purposeful introspection, like to arrive at the decisions. Like I just, I, I was almost in like a, a survivor mode. Like people are like, Oh my God, I can't believe you took custody of your sisters. I'm like, well, what else was I going to do? Mm -hmm. Like they had to be out of the environment that they were in. I could kind of support it and there was no one else to do it. So mm -hmm. like, there is no other decision for me. Like, okay, now I'm raised. I have to do this. I have to do this. Like, so for me, it was just like, this is what I, what I have to do. Even growing up, I, I talked to my mom and she's like, you know, about, you know, she's like, yeah, you were basically raising the kids while we were out, you know, you know, tending the, what they grew weed for a living. That's why we lived in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Uh, and, uh, back when it was not, uh, <laughs> legal. <laughs> right. Right. And, uh, and, uh. You know, it's just like these are just like I, I never really had like that much of a childhood either. But I, I was always in the care relation. Like I had people dependent on me all the time during that. And uh, I think that forced me not forced me, but like that put me in that position of like moving forward. And we see that in like, the, you know, you know, if you've got like a, a group that's, you know, had something, you know, working through a, like I said, survivor mentality, but like. Hey, you know, plane goes down and there's somebody that's, you know, you're out, out in the wilderness and there's a group of people and you're trying to get back somewhere and somebody's freaking out. What do you do? You put them in charge of someone else. And once mm. they're responsible for someone else, it changes their behaviors a lot. And I think that's where I was. I don't, I can't really take that much credit. I think it's just like, I did what needed to be done. Sure. And the, the, the introspection or more the getting to the Ouroboros, um, the, the, uh, the dragon phase was stimulated by my children. Like I didn't really have a lot of emotion about my upbringing or anything like it just was. But once I started watching them grow and then reflecting on the environment that I was in at the same age they were like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm like, I'm getting teary eyed. Like, I just don't like, like, pro like all of a sudden, like in my mid thirties, I'm like, Oh, wow, this is like, this is kind of hitting, hitting me like in the fields, pretty serious. And that started driving that, you know, that, that like really driving, like, what am I doing in the world? What am I doing for them? What am I? And like, you know, that's, that's truly like, not just the writing of the book. So it's covered in the, I kind of cover it in the, uh, the, 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 the intro or dedication on the book, but the way I live my life, and what I'm trying to do is not just to like create and express for myself, but to walk the walk and show them, show my children with my actions that they can form the world around them to whatever, whatever mold that they want to be, whatever they want to achieve out of life. Not just to tell them, you know, some philosophy or, right. you know, whatever, but like, cause we see a lot of, you know, that people, a lot of people can talk the talk. Oh, it's like, easy. <laughs> it, it is. But walking the walk is a whole different story. And uh, like I said, watching you, I know you know what I'm talking about. Like there's there, there's a lot of stress and work and all these sorts of things. But like to be able to, you know, as they're growing up to see that, you know, me doing what I'm doing is it is just like huge for me. That's probably one of the biggest reasons for me for doing what I do. Yeah. yeah and, makes sense. And, and, and I, I'm going to go off another tangent here, but actually maybe this will tie back in, uh, to where I wanted to go. But, uh, the, <clears throat> we see so many parents today that step away from who they are because their number one thing becomes becoming a parent. 
a caregiver of mm -hmm. removing the obstacles and everything around like they are there they're helicoptering they're doing all this stuff oh yeah and they're doing amazing like they work so hard for their kids but what are they showing their kids that there's nothing of value for them to do in the world other than once they have kids to become the same like don't you want them to do more well you're actually like not sh showing them not that that's not the case like that you always are going to be in that that servant mode that whatever like it's to me, like you need to be, yes, you need to be a great parent and do those sorts of things, but you also, you've got to stay authentic to who you are for your kid's sake. And that's what I'm talking about. Like if I can walk with the things that I want to walk, it actually is the best way to show my kids how that they can realize what they want out of life and to I think have the life point. they want. You know, a lot, a lot of people I, I see this with not only kids, but just relationships in general. Like a, like a man gets into a relationship with a girlfriend and, and, a, and his fiance and then eventually wife, and he gives up his friendships, he gives up his hobbies, he gives up his activities, and then he thinks he has to pour everything into her or when he has kids, pour everything that he has into the kids. And then these are guys who at, at some point will probably rebel. Uh, they'll they'll self-destruct, they'll sabotage the relationship, they'll sabotage the, the dynamic between them and their kids because they're so bitter – that they never took time to focus on themselves and lead by example and yeah. show what it means to have your own hobbies and pursuits and interests and things that you want to master. And then at once what happens when they sabotage, they turn back into their, their early 20s self again, right. which is not, 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 is doing nothing of value yeah, it's not for a, anybody it's not a place or, you themselves, go. <laughs> or, or themselves. Right. And so that the, the other point I was wanting to make is like, you know, because like with my siblings, my sisters that I raised and you know, I was very clear, like in the book, like I didn't, they're, they're all leading good lives and so much. And you'll see it when, you know, if you read the book, like so many people just literally died around me. Um, or if, you know, just their life is they're in prison, they're drug addicts. They're like, this is what happened. My sisters who I raised are not. And, but I can't take credit. Like I made them do the work. Like I didn't, it was the same process. I had the expectations and I showed them with my actions and I, I expected them to be successful, but they had to go work on getting their GED, work on getting a job when they're a teen, work on getting, you know, like the, like the expectations were there, but I didn't provide or give them anything as in like, and then, oh, here you're successful because of it. They still had to create that themselves. Right. And, uh, how old did you say you were when you, you took care of them? I think 21 is when I took custody of the first one. And how old um, was she when, when you were 21? Uh, she was 14 or 15, okay. somewhere in that range. All right. And then, uh, um, and then the last one finally moved out around the time I was about 30 years old, 29 or 30 years old. Okay. So there was, a. Yeah, about. Yeah, so you had him had him for a while. Yeah, yeah. So oh, well, man, that's not, tough. Not, it's like not, a twenty-one year old. That's crazy. Yeah. So and it wasn't all at once. So like, uh, uh, I I got the oldest uh, right away, and then about a year later, a uh, year or two later, I moved to Portland, took care of the second. I left my house to the oldest. I owned a, owned a house in uh, in the town I moved from. Mm -hmm. I moved up. I moved to the from a small. Uh, Southern Oregon town where I went to my undergraduate um, and was working to uh, Portland, Oregon to pursue my MBA and kind of advance my career. Left my, cause my, uh, the oldest was turning 18 at the time, had a job. I'm like, here's the keys to the house. <laughs> Take care of it. <laughs> you owe me rent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I moved to Portland, picked up the second and the youngest one, she was in, uh, she had a good place to live. So the second was in juvie. Like I, I got them all out of kind of bad spots. Um, yeah, sounds second like second was in juvie. That first, that well, that's why I didn't have her right away. And the third was, they, uh, her father technically had custody of her, but she wasn't living with him because it wasn't a safe environment. So she had a friend that she'd been living with her, their parents for a number of years, and then, uh, and then he died, and so mm -hmm. she was going to be go into the state care, and that's when I took, the took her. Um, right. So, yeah. So I never oh, had like, man. I never had all three at once. So it was all kind of like, you know, yeah, sporadic, sporadic. Um, but it was, you know, a good nine years that I, uh, I spent with, uh, with, with, with them.
Well, and it sounds like you spent enough time with each of them that you had the influence needed to be able to transform and turn around the the course that they were on. Because it sounds like the path that they were on was not the not the one that they are today. No, it was not a yeah. It was it was heading that spiral. That's why I said I had to step in. Right. Uh, so, yeah. But again, talk to like, me a little bit about um, your your concept of uh, the proactivity. You know, I I really like that idea and that concept. I think there's a lot of guys out there who are you know, they're just kind of drifting with the current and, and, and letting the, the circumstances take them where they want to go. And I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued and fascinated by this idea of just being proactive and being intentional about your life. Yeah, it's uh well, it's a, it's just part of that. Like you've got to start with like really understanding where you want to go. And, you know, we're not talking about like deciding I, I'm going to play in the, uh, the NFL, maybe it is, and then shouting it out across social media and telling everybody where you're going. Cause don't, don't do that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's your goal. Like, I, I wanted to be one of the strongest people in the world. And I didn't say that until a few years ago. Like, really? Yeah. What do you uh, because, think is the problem with doing that? Um, you're opening yourself up to a lot of people that uh, ridicule. Uh, you're opening, you know, people that are going to be a constant pessimist, downers, not supportive. Yeah. Uh, your really big goals, you need to keep really close and only let out to a very, very close circle. Like, you know, your spouse or your close friend or like those ones you really need to keep tight, um, mm -hmm. uh, is my opinion, because there's, there's a lot of talkers out there and, uh, it never goes anywhere and you need to, I think there's just some negative things that come with, with, uh, with that. Um, and it kind of sets the, 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 the the mind frame wrong. You're doing it for you. And so if you set this out in the public arena, like, hey, I'm going to do this huge exceptional thing, you better be pretty damn well close to achieving it, not 20 years off of it. Right. Because there's just, you're going to look foolish, honestly. And you're also setting yourself up for people not believing in your word. Um, you know, you know, because you're the big talker. It's like, anyway, there's a whole lot of things. There's a whole, there's a few pieces on psychology there. Don't do that. Keep those big goals tight, but know where you're going. Okay. Have that, you know, have that vision, that North star, I call it because every single day is an opportunity. And sometimes it doesn't feel like you're moving, moving anywhere that, that far, it's just one step in front of the next. What step today am I making that's advancing me towards that? Because if you start looking at your life, you'll realize that there's so like so many like days, weeks, months go by that you're literally not taking action moving forward on it. Mm -hmm. You're going grocery shopping, running the laundry, watching a game, you know, scrolling through Facebook. You're do like, and you've got to constantly be laying the groundwork and laying the groundwork for potentially other pathways that could fr develop from that. So. You're not going to have a perfect vision of knowing exactly what that North, you know, like here's the direction I'm heading in, but here's a lot of different outcomes as I come down those paths. And as you get closer, it's going to narrow. And I, I, I like to use a, you know, a tree. Like if you're sitting at the base of a tree and you're going, I'm going to end up at one point on the end of one of those branches right now, you're not going to like, there's a million leaves up there or needles. Like you don't know where that, point is, but right. the further, but, but every day it's like, okay, I'm working up, I'm working up. Okay. Here's a branch. Okay. I, I, I started, you know, the tree split and I'm starting to head a little to the left. I've just narrowed 50% of the outcomes. Right. Mm -hmm. And you keep just moving forward every day advancing. And, and it may be years of like feeling like you're not moving anywhere, but is it, is it stuff that's going to put you in that direction? Then all of a sudden things will start, start happening really fast as well. And, uh, it's, it, you've got, you've got to have that focus and keep that in the forefront of your mind because there's so many other fluff and crap that comes into our life that is filler. And sometimes it's self, self created because we want to feel like we're accomplishing a lot. Definitely. So we, so we create busy. I'm busy all day. Right. Can't, like, and, but like, okay, if you're busy all day and this is truly important to you, what of those busyness was actually within that? Right. What that actually moved the needle in the right direction. Exactly. And you'll find it's very, very little. You're just yeah. doing busy work. And you could use this with job, work, entrepreneur, like any, 
a whole lots of things, right? Um, that, uh, that I find that people just do so much that's literally adding no value in what they really want to accomplish in life. And, uh, so, so, you know, that's, that's kind of my views on that proactivity is keeping that to the forefront and always trying to figure out how can I advance, even if it, there's nothing, nothing to celebrate that day. Was it a move in the right direction? Yeah. 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 And it's, uh, I like your analogy of the branch and the trees as well, because you're never going to be able to see that point completely when you're on the ground. And as you continue to move up the the trunk and onto the limbs, the picture becomes more clear. And, you know, you yep. might find something there that you didn't, that you didn't see expect. from the ground yep. Yep. that you might say, oh, maybe that's actually not the branch I want to climb. But you don't get to figure that out until you're on the path. Exactly. Exactly. I think and that's where can... a lot of people fall short is they think they have to have these perfect – plans, they have to have the perfect strategy. And, and once they're on the path that they, they aren't able to deviate, they have to maintain that course. Like, no, you're going to discover things as you go along the way. Exactly. You can't predict this. You can't, and you can't, and you can't make that happen necessarily to just know that. And, and to think like, I know exactly the path, like this perfect place of where I want to be. No, but we need to have a general idea. And that's where like understanding your, you know, the values and like how you want to live, it's going to help you create that in your mind. But yeah, it's going to be, you're going to, you're going to be, you know, working that, that, that path, trying mm -hmm. to find that best one. And then the closer you get, the better you're going to know exactly what it is and what that right is. Sure. How does this tie into your idea of grand goals? Cause you're talking, you've talked a little bit about big goals. You've got the grand goal shirt on. You talk about that in the book itself. So explain that to me. So, uh, the grand goals, uh, that was, uh, that was basically my retirement piece, uh, uh, from the lifting. Right. Um, so it was a way of like expressing to, you know, people publicly because I, you know, I was a known figure in a, in, you know, in, in, in a sport and people are always like, what competition are you doing next? What are you training for? What are you? And I'm like, mm. I'm not doing this anymore. And here's why. And here's the things that I want to chase. And it happened to be a thousand pounds uh, deadlift and a thousand pound squat. And, uh, so grand <laughs> for a thousand, but, right. uh, um, but also ties into other things like, yeah, I mean like chase those big, gnarly, scary things. So this ties back into what we were discussing earlier, chasing fear. And it doesn't have to be a, a lifting, like it's like chasing those big, scary things in life. So, you know, when I've, mentoring people or coaching people that I've worked with through the years, you know, sometimes it's just drawing that out of people. It's, you know, could be the 50 year old that's always wanted to go back to school, but they just never like, you know, they, it, it scares them for some reason, you know, mm -hmm. the impacts on work, family, but they just always want, like when you feel that, that churn in your stomach, when you're thinking about something, that mix of excitement and fear that is your signal that that is the thing to chase. Something that is just out there, barely possible, but you think you can actually do it, okay? It's got some level of realism, but it's, it, it is still so much, of a, so, so much of a reach. It's a reach into the unknown um, that it scares you. That is your signal. And that's what kind of grand goals is about is keeping that. And trust me, if you, if you keep things like that in your life, one, you're not going to get soft. Yeah, sure. Definitely. <laughs> so that's your, that's how you stay, you know, that mentally, emotionally in touch, but trust me, you're going to, you bring that level of engagement and excitement and fear into your life and keep it there. You're going to be engaged with everything else. Let's talk about that individual that has that that cake job Monday through Friday, looking towards, you know, having beers and, and getting drunk with their buddies on Friday night or Saturday night. It's their, their whole thing to look forward to. They have so little engagement in their life. They're also going to be the person that comes home and is likely not engaged with their wife, not engaged with their kids mm -hmm. because they're just, you know what I'm talking like these, these people, like you've got to have, you've got to have passion. You've got to have drive and, and, and guess what? If you're passionate about something, you're also scared about it. So that's grand goals. So for me, as chasing these unfathomable things, I, I now hold the Guinness World Record 
uh, for the sumo deadlift. I did a thousand pounds for almost three reps. When I talk about keeping things close to yourself, three reps was the goal the whole time. I only told the world I was going to do it once. Oh, is that, that I right? Was going, I was going for a thousand pound deadlift, but I wanted to be the only person in history to do a thousand pounds for reps because for reps. nobody, nobody's ever done it and nobody still has. That's what I was going to ask. Is it, so, and there's different classes and categories, right? So ha, have they even pulled that much off the, I mean, off the ground at all, just in different forms? Is that how that works? So different forms. Yeah. So there's a, a conventional deadlift and a sumo deadlift. Right. So okay. there's five, there's now, uh, there's now a total of five people that have pulled a thousand pounds. In, in uh, any form, is that what you're saying? In any form. Okay, and so makes sense. Those, yep. those are all conventional. I'm the only person that's done it sumo. And they're all about, I think the lightest person was 380 pounds and the heaviest was 440 pounds. Okay. I, I so did mine. Huge guys. Yeah. Yes. They're huge and guys. St and still, you're a, a very big man also. I'm, what I'm, what I'm do you weigh? Uh, right now, I'm 275. When I yeah. did it, I was around 260, 265. Okay. So yeah. a good... A good 120 pounds less than Lighter. any other person that's ever done it before. So, and uh, sorry, it sounds like I'm bragging. The oldest person that's ever done it too. <laughs> that's impressive. So how old were you when you did that? Uh, I was 39. Okay, Let's yeah. Let's see, it was 20. God, I did it actually. I think the year that uh, I, did, I did it not long after our podcast. I did it. Oh, is that right? Okay. I did it, I think, in October of 2016. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that, so wow. I, I wasn't going to go out in the world. Like, I wanted to put something out there. And the only reason I did is because of me being a known figure. And it's not, it was cr a crazy goal to say that I'm going to do this because nobody was even close to doing it at the time. Mm. And, uh, but I wasn't going to go like, ah, and I'm going to do it for reps. And, uh, you know, like, I, I wanted <laughs> right. to keep, I, I always keep like, you know, some of that, because it, it, the goal is for me. So if you put, that was the other reason for like not putting those big things out there, pub, like all of it, you lose, you, you become accountable to the, to everyone else. And right. that, that could be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing if you st start chasing it and everything about it, because I feel I have to do it because I said it to sure. these other people that literally, I don't even know who they are. Right. Like. You know, There's this other I, interesting phenomenon that that has been experienced as well when somebody puts out some some audacious goal like that is that they start to receive the accolades. Like I see this, for example, when somebody says, I'm going to run a marathon and then people are like, oh, congratulations. You're awesome. That's amazing. It's like you're actually not yet because you yes, like just yeah. saying it doesn't mean anything. But then the brain doesn't really distinguish between the accolades for saying you're going to do it versus the accolades for actually doing it. So you become, you almost become content and satisfied with saying it rather than actually doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Now it was, a, it was funny when I was in the training, cause there's a point where I was pulling like upper nine hundreds for like reps and doing it like a few times a week. And people uh -huh. were like, why the hell aren't you pulling a thousand yet? Clearly you're capable of it. But I didn't, didn't answer, but it was, uh, people started picking up on like, wait a minute, <laughs> what, what, what's he doing? <laughs> right. Right. That's because interesting. That, that, that wasn't the goal. And, yeah. uh, yeah, but well, Chris, I wasn't this, gonna... has been, this has been awesome, man. I, I, I know there's so much more that we can delve into and I would just say, pick up a copy of the book. Cause I was actually really, I was, I was entertained. I mean, I, I, it's kind of a funny word to use in the context of you sharing your life, but I was just blown away with the experience and what you went through and then how you tied everything into to these lessons chronologically through your life is actually a really powerful read. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback. It's, yeah. uh, it's been incredible. The feedback I've been getting, I mean, it's, oh, I bet. it's, it, it's changed some people's lives. Like it's, no uh, doubt. you know, no doubt. And, and, and that, that feels great. Like to be able to have something that, you know, provided somebody to do their work themselves, their homework. And, uh, and, and make significant change in their life because of right. that. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a couple of additional questions. The first one I did, I did give you a little bit of a heads up and that is what does it mean to be a man? So I think I've covered a lot of that, like, but not specifically over sure, the course of, course. of this. Right. Uh, but you know, uh, a man in my eyes is, is, is a, is a leader and you know, like it doesn't mean a leader of a business or elite, but like a leader of, their family, the people around them. And it doesn't mean like the person that like leadership doesn't mean 
a manager, a director. It means somebody that is providing like the, um, I don't know, the, the, the motivation, the, the setting an example, but driving people to do those things and, and to do, to become like, again, like better at who they are. And to do that as a man, you need to be a pillar of strength, a pillar of physical, mental, and emotional strength. Okay. And we could throw spiritual in there as well, but it's like, you can't be the person that's, you know, flighty at the, you know, with the wind picks up, but, you know, emotionally, it doesn't mean like emotionally reserved or, you know, not, not being able to, you know, engage in that manner, but you need to be solid that people can rely on you, that your, that your wife, that your kids, that your friends, you know, if they need a shoulder to lead on, they need help in tough times, advice that like, they know that they can come to you and you're a pillar of str- like you're, you're unwavering, uh, in, in that manner and being able to support. So that's, that's my view being a pillar of strength, you know, beyond the physical nature, physical, yes. mental, and emotional. Yeah, that's awesome. Obviously, something we attest to as well, we talk about preside, which is synonymous with leadership. So wholeheartedly agree. Well, how do we connect with you and pick up a copy of the book? Yeah. So uh, um, I'll give you a bunch of links. So ChristopherDuffin.com, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R, Duffin.com, D-U-F-F-I-N. Uh, there's a link to like all my businesses, um, which are fantastic if you want to check them out. There's a link to uh, where to buy the book on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all that sort of stuff. Uh, there's also a link on how to download the audio copy for free. Uh, so that's a, that's really cool. Um, and, um, the, you can find me on the, the social platforms I mostly interact on is Instagram and LinkedIn. I know it sounds a little weird, but I just, Facebook is not my thing anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, LinkedIn is uh, working pretty well for me. You just type in Chris Duffin. I'll be on there. Yeah, but like my, my, my Instagram handle is mad underscore scientist underscore Duffin. Um, Kabuki Strength is the, uh, is the primary venture um, that, uh, that I'm involved with on a daily basis. Credible resource. So uh, K-A-B-U-K-I strength.com. So. Yeah. Nice, man. We'll sync it all up. I, I want to let you know, especially as you were talking about what it means to be a man, that, that I feel like you're somebody who embodies that. You know, you, you've shown yourself to be physically strong, mentally, emotionally strong. Um, and I know your work is doing good things. You've been instrumental and influential in my life. So really appreciate you taking some time to join us back again and share some of these stories. And it's, uh, it's powerful to see where you've come from and how far you've come and what you've been able to do with your life. Yep. And that's, that is the, right there. The, the point of the book is, I, the story is not to say, oh, woe is me or, you know, oh, I've done all this. It's just to show you if you put these principles and philosophies into place, how far you can move that needle. And that's what makes it a great story. So right on. But, Thanks, Chris. But, Appreciate you, brother. All right. Thank you.